So thank you so much for coming out on our first evening of rain, I think it is. Mm. So um, uh, I, I think I know almost everyone in the room, but I'm Brian Fariso, the director of the museum, and this has been a, uh, something I've talked about for some time with Stephanie, and I said, you know, I want to do a conversations with the curators. Stephanie, our associate director of education public programs, and, and finally, Stephanie got me going, and we decided to do it, and we decided to do it on the 125th year because I think it's a great opportunity to reflect forward, understand why this museum exists, and the art is at the core, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And um, something I'm very proud of uh, with this museum is our curatorial team, and I wanted to make sure our community um, really understands the work they do, their background, and what they bring to our city and our institution, our region. But before I start, um, one of the things, the formative moment for me in developing this program. I was a young intern at the Newark Museum in Newark, New Jersey in the 1990s. And part of that experience for me was to walk around the halls and to hang out with curators. So I would go down to, there was a curator of decorative arts, and some of my colleagues will know who this is, is Ulysses Dietz, um, who was a very, very talented curator who oversaw the complete reinvention of what was then called the decorative arts wing, the Ballantine House of the Newark Museum. Uh, Ulysses had the best stories. He was the most informed, passionate, funny, committed, and friendly person I had ever met. And he really made the museum welcoming to me and also opened up the world of art museums and the world of art in a way I hadn't seen before. I had studied it in books, I had created it as an artist, but this was an opportunity to deal with uh, a scholar. Uh, the other individual there, and I know Mary Beth knows Valerie Reynolds, a very generous person, uh, and I say generous, Valerie is, was one of the great curators of Asian art, and if you've been to the Newark Museum, one of the foremost collections of Tibetan art, and she would talk to me about Tibet all the time. So those conversations in particular really inspired me and made me want to hang out with curators. <laughs> Go figure. It really did. And then, and then I was presented with this opportunity to come to Portland about 12 years ago. And I saw nothing but opportunity. You know, my predecessor, John, had done some incredible things with the building and the facilities and exhibitions. But I think he also knew, and I think the board and the community knew, now is a time to dig into program and content in the curatorial area of this museum. And what I mean by digging in is we had about three and a half curators. I say half curators when I arrived because Terry Totemeyer, you may recall, was a part-time curator. Mm -hmm. So um, today we have actually, with Jeannie Kanmozzo, uh, we have actually eight curatorial positions. We're searching for a curator of Native American art, which we're in the midst of that process. So that's really quite um, a change that we've come to realize here at the museum. And I'm, you know, people have said to me, well, Brian, what's your legacy? Is it gonna be the Rothko Pavilion? Is it, you know, the car show or the Leica show? No. The legacy for me is going to be making sure that our community has uh, great curatorial leaders in all areas. And curators will help and define this museum uh, in a way that the impact will be felt for generations. It'll be generational how someone like Mary will shape this museum. So um, that's a little uh, pre preface to these talks. We have multiple ones over the years. I need to thank not only Mary tonight, but also Charles. Charles on our team here um, helps me get organized and helps all of us get organized. Charles, thank you very much. So with that, I wanted to give a formal introduction to my colleague, and I'm so proud to have her up here on stage, uh, Mary Weaver Chapin. And let me give you a little background on Mary. She is a graduate of Wellesley College and earned, and earned her doctorate in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York at New York University. And for those of you who know, it's one of the most prestigious and difficult art history programs in the country, and uh, it's very highly regarded around the world. Her dissertation examined the interplay of printmaking, publicity, and celebrity in the prints and posters of Henri um, de Toulouse-Lautrec. 
She trained at the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, before joining the staff of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she was part of the research team for Van Gogh and Gauguin, a major exhibition, The Studio of the South, in partnership with the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. If you've been there, it's a wonderful place. Mary's next project at the Art Institute was she was the curator of the award-winning exhibition Toulouse-Lautrec and Montmartre in conjunction with the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And we're gonna talk a little bit about, about these projects, and they were all accompanied with significant publications. From 2005 to 2012, Mary was the curator of prints and drawings at the Milwaukee Art Museum a museum I used to work at as well. Her most significant projects include Posters of Paris, Toulouse-Lautrec and his contemporaries, a major exhibition that was at Milwaukee as well as traveled to the Dallas Museum of Art. And she authored the catalog resume of the Prince of Warrington Colescott, brother of Robert Colescott. Mary grew up in Gig Harbor, Washington, was lured back to her native Pacific Northwest and joined the staff of the museum in 2012. It was a great day. I remember she applied and I was like, oh my goodness. Because for those of you who may remember, Mary spoke uh, on a project we did. I think it was The Dancer. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. you were a guest and, speaker. Um, yes, it came out in 2005. Five. It was my first. Yeah, and so she came out and spoke, and I was like, wow, she wants to come to this institution, which is really <laughs> gratifying. Um, today, she oversees a large and varied collection of over 20,000 prints. Gives you a sense of the magnitude there. Drawings, posters, and artist books, and maintains an active exhibition schedule featuring prints spanning 500 years of graphic art history. And one of the unique things about Mary's position is she needs to know a little bit and a lot about everything. <laughs> Murray brings to Portland a wide professional network of curatorial contacts in the museums, uh, large and small. She's in demand often. You may find Mary speaking at the Phillips Collection in, in, um, in Washington, the National Gallery, the Cleveland Museum of Art, as well as the Detroit Art Institute, uh, and is frequently asked to consult on Lautrec exhibitions. I, I received a call from the director of the Art Gallery of Ontario, can we borrow Mary? I received a call from the, my colleague at the Seattle Art Museum, can we borrow Mary? All, it always happens and Mary and I are always trying to balance her time and her commitment here as well as her own life because Mary, is, as many of you know, is, uh, uh, is married to her husband, Steve, and has two children, Oliver and Sadie, and she loves hiking, um, and she also loves her husband, I think. <laughs> I do, I do. So um, that's my preface, and what I thought we were gonna do is, I have three sections. Mary and I talked about three sections. Let's talk a little bit about the history, and how did this collection develop? Because I think, again, as we, as we reflect forward, um, the history is so significant. So Mary, what do we have here and why do we have this slide up? So we are starting here with the first major gift of prints to the Portland Art Museum it came in 1916 and it came from Henrietta Failing. And she donated um, over a hundred works by the great Italian master Piranese. And it's marvelous because it was such a, um, a monumental gift at the time. Well, I guess that's a bad pun because they're all monuments. Um, monumental gift at the time. And it's one that we've continued to build on. So um, Henrietta Failing gave us about just over 100 works. And in the 100 intervening years, we've doubled that collection. And in fact, on Monday, we'll be presenting some more gifts of work by Piranese to the uh, collections committee. So it's something I want to touch upon about how these gifts, um, these collections that from 100 years ago are still relevant to us today in terms of our collecting priorities and also um, so important in terms of setting the tone of what we're going to do here, which is study original works of art. Yeah, so I think you raise a good point. You know, this museum at the end of the day consists of collections. It's a collection of collections. Over our history, people have given collections to the museum, and that's why we have the works we have. We buy once in a while, but the overwhelming majority mm -hmm. are yes, collections absolutely. coming to this institution. And I think this is a great um, example of the foundation in which this museum was founded upon. Interestingly, our incoming chairman, Pat Ritz, mm. is a descendant of Henrietta Failing. So um, Pat will take uh, the chairmanship of the board on November 3rd, and it's a nice connection to have it that sure history. Is, yeah. Uh, and then now this person, and I love this picture, um, and, and who is Winslow Ayer? I know the answer, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, um, some of you have heard me refer to Winslow Ayer as my boyfriend, uh, because he was a marvelous collector and donor, and his gift, um, at the time of his death in 1935, 
is just uh, so important for this museum's history. Almost everything with his name associated with it is superb. So there are three glorious Whistler prints in the Whistler show, all from Mr. Ayer. A beautiful Degas pastel from Mr. Ayer. In fact, I think they're in the next slide. Let's see what he gave us. Ah, yes, our beautiful Mary Cassatt. And it's interesting, when you think about his life dates, he was buying these objects as contemporary art. I mean, he was not the most cutting edge, but he was buying art by the generation of artists who had either just recently passed away or whose reputations were rising. And his acquisitions have been so important for my collection. So every time I see, if I'm looking through the database and I'm going to pull out a print and I see that it came from Winslow Air, I have this little jolt of anticipation knowing that it will be very high quality, very beautiful condition. Yeah, and just as a side note, the Degas the uh, work in particular, you may recall we developed an entire exhibition around this, and it's such a signature piece for this museum, and you're absolutely right, Mary. I mean, Winslow Air gave us masterworks that really have formed the, the, the core of your collection, mm -hmm. and it's exciting to see these two in particular. It's interesting about the pastel, too. It was the first drawing that entered the collection, really, as a drawing or, or pastel. So that marks the beginning of our pastel collection. Now, these two works in particular also from Air, yes? Um, this marks um, a change where we're seeing in the 1940s some excellent purchases and gifts. These were both purchases, but they were done with funds. One was um, established by Mr. Ayer in memory of his wife, and the other was um, for the Ella B. Hirsch Fund. And it's interesting to think in the 1940s that the, um, I'd love to thank whoever bought these for the museum, that they were really thinking about um, critical, uh, some of the best prints by these artists. So you see the Toulouse-Lautrec jockey, that's one of his very finest prints, and then this um, dancer with raised skirt by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. Um, both of those are really high points of the artist's career. So they're buying great prints, and they're buying not just some other things they made, but the, some of the finest. Yeah, and it's great to see the Kirchner in particular, and we have a strong German Expressionist collection in that area. Now, we don't have the paintings in that area, although no. we have a Max Beckmann, which is really strong. Um, the prints really speak to that important movement of the, of mm -hmm. the 20th century. Um, now, this is a great story. Uh, Talk to us about this one, um, Pablo Picasso, and how does it come out pretty well? It looks pretty good, doesn't yeah, it? We're yeah. going to, we have some new photography uh, scheduled for this work. Uh, as you know, I care for more than 20,000 objects. They live in little black boxes in the vault where they are temperature and humidity controlled. So when I'm trying to think of um, uh, exhibitions and, and things I want to do, my first step is the database. And the database will tell me who, what, when, where, and usually have a picture attached to it. And as I was doing some research, I said, there is no picture attached to this Picasso record. And I said, well, I, I haven't seen this. I'm going to go down to the vault and have a look. And discovered it was being stored in Beaverton because it's uh, framed. So I asked our registrars to bring it in and um, not expecting much of anything and was astonished when it came. It is an absolutely superb print. It is one of just three known impressions of this image that Picasso printed on parchment, so like on calf skin. And it's stretched tight like a drum. It's drum stretch parchment. And it is so vibrant and so alive. I mean, really, when you think about that, that um, calfskin being a, a living membrane, um, I'm looking for a very good excuse to get it out on view soon. So we've had this since the 1950s. Uh, it just hasn't had any recent daylight. So we'd love to, to get it up to share with the public. Yeah, and I love this. I mean, if you think about Picasso, um, he was a child protege. I mean, he knew how to draw at a very young age in the classical style, academic style. He, he understood forms and the human figure in a way that um, was really quite, he was a protege, he, he really was. And then he moves into this. And you know, Mary, with this image in particular, looking at it, I can see that depth of knowledge and his ability to understand anatomical forms, drawing, drafting, shading, his aggressive nature, and his ability to experiment all together in this, in this image, and really then does set the, the stage for cubism and what mm -hmm. happens in the 20th century. Great, great work of art. Now, 
we have to talk about this gentleman because he lives large within our museum. Uh, and the late Gordon Gilkey is someone I never met. I think maybe some of you may have. What an incredible force, especially for your department as well as this museum. Let's talk about Gordon, and I love this photo uh, by Stu Levy on the left, who's also an artist and a member of Photography Council. Um, I'm curious, who knew Gordon? Just raise their hands. Okay, so wow, we yes. know, okay. Yeah. So maybe you can also enlighten us a little bit at the end about his personality, because Mary, how do you how do you understand Gordon, and how does he fit into our history? Well, I knew I knew him by reputation before I came. I'd never met him, but I realized how important he was for our community after I arrived here. And people would come up and introduce me, introduce themselves to me, and by way of introduction, they would say, "I knew Gordon Gilkey," and enough people did it to make me understand. Oh, this is this is like a password. It's a code. I'm in part of this club now. And um, I like to think of him that way in terms of the amazing amount of community he built. And the fact that years later, uh, 18 years since he passed away, people are still coming up and, and tapping me and saying, I knew Gordon. So for us, he's, he's hugely important. Um, I love the photograph here by Stu Levy. You see Gordon in his three different guises as a scholar there at the bookshelf with this marvelous reference library that he left us. Uh, in the vault, um, you know, prowling the aisles, and then as a printmaker. So for me, I know Gordon as a curator, and I, I know um, the, the scholarly work, work he left behind. I really rely on the community to tell me more about Gordon as the printmaker and the educator. Yeah. And you know, what I feel from someone like Gordon Gilkey, and you know, I'd appreciate it if someone um, corrects me if I'm wrong, but there is a there is a curatorial um, uh, sort of characteristic that some curators come out of the tract of being artists. We saw this in Terry Totemeyer. Uh, Terry was a photographer and he became a curator. What I feel with Gordon is the artistic uh, commitment mm -hmm. to the art form, the making, the making. He knew the art form, he knew how to make it, and therefore his interpretation and his collecting followed his ability um, or his own artistic impulses. And then resulted in, I think, a number of works in the collection that um, could be perceived as maybe he found in some friend's studio, or that he also then may be found at a gallery. I mean, he has a wide range of collecting interests, mm -hmm. and I think the collection reflects that. Again, coming from the, the impulses of an artist, and I can see that in Gordon's work in particular. Well, and this next slide is a great example of some of the highlights from the Gilkey collection, and there are thousands and thousands of prints, so it's hard to select just a few. But this uh, stunning German Expressionist color woodblock print by Max Pechstein is one of my favorites from the Gilkey collection. And the other thing I figured out is I don't know how it's possible, but I think Gordon knew everyone. And all the printmakers along the West Coast, all the printmakers and other in universities. And one of those was uh, the wonderful artist, activist, nun, Corita Kent. And you see one of her works on the screen. And it's been exciting for me to discover what's in the collection, uh, use that as a basis for an exhibition, but then also say, hey, these are the wonderful prints we have now, but where can we build? Where do we need to augment um, to really take our collection to the next level? Yeah, and I think Gordon also reflected a moment, and part of a strategy that this museum has adopted is because the acquisition funds are lean, they're lean here, um, we, we acquire through taking in large collections and bodies of work. And again, the generosity of donors mm -hmm. and private collectors giving us work. And I think someone like Gordon in particular really took advantage of the generosity of our community and the enthusiasm that he created yeah. around print and print collecting. Now, after Gordon left, we uh, brought on Annette Dixon and she was here when I arrived. Let's talk about a little bit of Annette, Annette's tenure because it. It changes, it, it's a changed trajectory for the museum and, and in particular, the print area. Yes, and I see that as I go through files too. Annette was a consummate scholar and I love this portrait of her in front of that wall of books with the prints in front of her. Um, she brought a really keen eye to the scholarship and research and cataloging. So some of the greatest work she did, you'll probably never see. I mean, a lot of it is in the research files, in our database. And, um, and she made some great acquisitions. I have two slides up here to show of 
two important gifts that came in under her time. Um, you might recognize the Toulouse-Lautrec, that's the uh, seated clown ass, and that is one of a series of 12 extraordinary color lithographs by the artist Toulouse-Lautrec, and it was a gift of Roger and Laura Meyer. Also, during Annette's time, we got the estate of um, Beth Van Hosen, um, a wonderful painter from the Bay Area, painter, printmaker, who has meticulous renderings of animals, people, um, even food. And you'll see some of Van Hosen's work in my next exhibition. I think some of Annette's um, acquisitions, purchases, are on this slide here. And I, um, I haven't talked to Annette about it, but I imagine what she was thinking is that she stepped back and said, okay, I'm walking into this amazing collection here at the Portland Art Museum. What are the highs? Where are the lows? Where are the gaps? And she noticed that we're really lean on old master works. And so she was able to purchase with funds from our, our limited funds and fundraising from the community, um, two really important, these are just two of several, really important old master works. So uh, in fact, I don't think she even had the opportunity to exhibit them during her tenure, uh, but, but I've been able to show both. And the point is, is that a curator is really working kind of for the next generations. Um, I'm hoping that you know, 30, 40, 100 years from now, someone will say, oh, I'm really glad whoever it was bought this. So even though Annette was never able to show these while she was a curator here, you know, we've benefited from them, the, the exhibitions have benefited, and our collection is really the stronger because of it. And Goltius on the left and Canaletto on the right. Yes. Yes, and um, great, great old master works that we're very, very thrilled to have here. Um, now, Mary, let's step back because again, I like to find out where you came from. Your story is, is fascinating. Um, I think the number of years our curators spend studying and training to get to this point is really quite remarkable. And I think your professional journey, as we talked about, started at the Met, but really formed at the Art Institute of Chicago, yeah. one of the great institutions in the country, if not the world, and very much part of a, a collection that really has works in your area of strength mm -hmm. and your focus. So talk a little bit about your experience and then on the screen you'll see a number of projects and touch on a few of those projects and, and, and what, you, um, what you learned from them and, and, and what they did. Well, I went to graduate school fully intending to become a professor of art history. Uh, but while I was in school, there were a few classes offered at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they fit into my schedule in graduate school. So I said, okay, you know, I'll try one of those. And I ended up taking a seminar with the head of the drawings and prints department, um, George Goldner, who's a great personality in our world. And he could see, he's an old master specialist, he could see that was not my area, but he said, you should work with our 19th century person. So I started training with Colta Ives, and she had me help her with this exhibition, The Private Collection of Edgar Degas. And that's when my journey started towards being a curator, is um, making that move. Uh, it was from that job, and then I went away and did my dissertation research in, in France, and came back, and um, a job fell out of the sky right into my lap when I, I moved to Chicago. And I became the research assistant for Van Gogh and Gauguin, the studio of the South. And that was a marvelous uh, exhibition project for me because I got to see how really good curators work. Um, I was very low on the totem pole, but I was watching how everything was made. And it really helped broaden my network of international contacts. And it was also, interestingly, the same moment. I worked all day um, on this exhibition, but I was also writing my dissertation. So I was getting up at you know five in the morning to write, going to work, doing more work, and then sometimes staying later. And I think I like to joke that I never would have finished my dissertation if I hadn't been working full time because I had those, those limitations. Um, and so that was were a marvelous project. Then? Were you married um, then? Yes, I had moved to Chicago to, to marry my husband. And when I moved to town, I knew uh, two people, my husband and someone from graduate school who worked at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I went to have lunch with her. And she said, OK, at the Art Institute. And she said, OK, but before we go, I have to drop off this package up at the Department of European Painting. So we go up to European Painting. She starts talking. I'm standing there for like a half an hour before she introduces me. And finally, someone says, who's she? 
Well, this is Mary. She just got back from France doing her dissertation research. And they look at me and say, you, you read French? I said, yeah. They said, are you, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, nothing. And they said, come back for an interview. That was on a Thursday, and I started on Monday. So really, that one fell into my lap. So one thing you mentioned, and I, I, I don't know if everyone knows this, one of the great barriers for some to become a curator is languages. And to be a curator, you need proficiency in at least two languages besides English. And it's quite a challenge. I mean, you need to understand a lot of it, German is one. Is, so is, do you study German and French? I did, yes. Yeah. I, um, I thought my career track was going to go a German direction, so I studied German in college. And by the time I got to my graduate institute, <laughs> the German professor had died. And um, the, they had just hired uh, stolen Linda Nochlin away from Yale. So I said, okay, I guess I'm doing French and learn French during graduate school. And for those of you who have heard Mary speak, I love her French accent. And I mean, I have a French teacher. My wife is a French teacher. My kids speak French. And I just love to hear your accents, oh. Mary. You do. I bet your wife doesn't like my accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always exactly. a debate who has the appropriate accent yeah. in French. Yeah. So I think you yeah. do. Thank I, you. I enjoy it. Um, and then the center picture there, who is that? Okay. I know who it is, but. Let's yes, so um, I'll mention that after Van Gogh Gauguin, um, we were able to do Toulouse, Lautrec, and Montmartre at the Art Institute. And that was partially, I had just finished my dissertation, and we were able to get some of that research into that catalog. Um, and then my husband's work took us up to Wisconsin. So I found a job at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Brian had already left. Um, and I had two major projects. One was the catalog raisonné of the Prince of Warrington Colescott. And you see me sitting there with Warrington um, in the center. So we're, sign we're at a book signing. And that was a great project because he's really a printmaker's printmaker. And to sit there with him and hear about his decades, he was in his 80s at the time. He's now 98, uh, 96, 96. Um, I felt like I learned basically 100 years of printmaking from a man who had lived it. And then my uh, next major project at the Milwaukee Art Museum was a show entitled Posters of Paris. And uh, you can see the book cover there and, and my uh, research assistant, Krista, in the photo. And I, I always warn that you should probably never ha let me do big shows because it seems like at the Art Institute, right when Toulouse-Lautrec and Montmartre was about to go on the walls, I got recruited for Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, Posters of Paris was about to go up, and I was recruited for Portland. So um, just get nervous any time one of my big shows opens. Yeah, so let's cancel that Navi <laughs> project. Um, for those of you who know Mary, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, is working on a project um, on the Nabi, which is really exciting for us. So maybe we should just delay yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Delay, delay. it. Um, so, but I think one of the great, <laughs> I love this because, you know, for me, and I think for many of you know, uh, me and my family, family is so important to all of us. And I think all of us here at the museum, and, and, and I think it's important for the team and everyone to understand that, you know, this is an institution that embraces family and that this is your life. I mean, we live here, we, we work every day, um, and we're passionate, and, uh, and, and, and it's very important for me, and I'm so happy, Mary, to have these pictures up because <laughs> I think your life is shaped like mine by our families and our own personal yeah. experiences. And I think Portland is so great for us as a museum because people can really have a quality of life that's special and, and be here. So Absolutely. talk a little bit about these pictures. So I chose these pictures because we moved here in March of 2012, and it was the wettest March on record. And we are just soaking wet in both of these pictures. Um, we didn't know anyone. The kids were starting new schools. We got them you know, rain slickers at REI and just started hiking. And so I think we visited just about every waterfall in the rain, in the gorge. And one of my favorite stories, my daughter was only four years old at the time. And you can see sort of by her um, some mossy rocks. And my daughter ran her hand over them. And she said, Mommy, what is this green stuff? I said, oh, that's moss. And she said, oh, what's it for? And I, I almost wanted to cry. I mean, those are the Chapin's encounter seasonal affective disorder. Um, <laughs> 
because it would not stop raining. And here I had this poor child who couldn't figure out what moss was. Um, I think my husband adapted first. He's the um, muddy fellow on a bike. This is, for those of you who know, uh, the epicenter of cyclocross racing, which ought to be done in heavy rain and mud. Um, so we, we had a tough march, and then we acclimated. Um, as Brian mentioned, I grew up in Gig Harbor, Washington. So moving back meant getting closer to grandparents, to cousins, to all those good things. And it's really, we're just so glad we made the move. The, the funny joke for me is I interviewed for my job in June or July, I think it was. And the trustees brought me in, and Bill and Helen Joe are here. They were part of the process. And, and uh, yeah, it was beautiful, sunny weather. I think it was 72. And I stayed at the Heathman, and I said, why would people not want to live here? It's fantastic. And then November hit. <laughs> That's yeah. what she wrote, and yeah. I think this is it. But it's, uh, yeah, well, it's starting now. Okay, so let's talk about these exhibitions, because a lot of Mary's job is really working on um, the, the center f downstairs, the Gilkey Center, and, and getting up these exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, and I love the exhibitions for their own sake, but it's also such a great way to learn about the collection. Um, some of my happiest days are when I discover things that maybe were miscatalogged or um, misattributed and getting the correct information out there, and also finding where do we have gaps, where do we need to fill. So through a really, I think, energetic um, series of exhibitions. We've had things on um, diverse as artist books to um, a look back at 100 years back to the um, graphic arts of World War I, uh, to collection shows based around a theme like In the Studio or Feast and Famine. So for me, you know, the, this is called, these are the Copeland Galleries and they're quite special. And they're special because they also allow an intimacy with the mm -hmm. works of art that prints gives us. Um, and also, I think, Mary, you've been very, very talented. Uh, I think a great curator can tell great stories. And I think you've done a remarkable job of using the collection to tell stories, revealing stories. For example, um, the Hockney Project in particular. Talk a little bit about that. That was fun. It was also a collaboration we did with the uh, opera. Yes, um, the Hockney uh, exhibition came from, the objects came from the Hockney Foundation. But they said, basically, OK, take what you want to tell this story about David Hockney's involvement with the opera. And it was, uh, it was so fun to dive into the material. And I would say the most fun I've ever had giving a gallery talk was to the cast of the opera here in Portland. Um, the Portland Opera Company staged uh, Rake's Progress, and they used the Hockney designs. And I knew that opera singers could sing, and they were talented, but I didn't realize how funny they were and how quick on their feet and, um, and so responsive. So that, was, uh, that will go down, I think, as history. Um, for me, as one of the most engaging yeah, gallery Yeah, and talks Mary I've reminded done. me. I think um, when she started, she had, or Bruce gave her the the mandate of you had how many weeks to prepare for the oh, Ellsworth Kelly show? Um, I showed up in March, and he said, "Oh, by the way, you're opening an exhibition on Ellsworth Kelly in June." Yeah, so get it together. Uh, Sarah yeah. Krajewski also had that with Warhol. <laughs> I don't know if Sarah's here, but um, we also gave her that mandate. So maybe it's a a, a rite of passage yeah. for our curators. Um, Okay, so let's transition a little bit to the future. Where does this collection go? What's your vision? How is it being shaped? And, and maybe these two works are representative of where you want to take us. Yes, I think of uh, when people say, what, what's the future? Where are we going? I think old and new. So our old master's collection is still pretty thin. And believe it or not, there are acquisitions that can be made. They are, happily for us, they are not terribly in favor. Everyone, the art market seems to be driving up contemporary prices. But this beautiful piece by Albrecht Durer, we were able to get at New for the Wall. And it is perhaps the finest Durer in our collection now. And I think by, by going back and making sure we have these fundamentals, some of the best artists in the Western tradition, it um, offers so many opportunities to reflect if, well, what, are, what are contemporary artists doing, who's looking at Durer, what has his influence been. And then the other direction, you might not think this is new. I think of 19th century as, as being new. Uh, but my area of strength is 19th century France. And so that means I feel the most confident making acquisitions there. I really, really know the material in the market. And uh, we've been building our collection of 19th century French, really building on some strengths. 
And I should point out both of these works were purchased through community involvement. Uh, the Durer was new for the wall, and this wonderful tiger um, looking rather Japonesque, or maybe more Korean, is that what you were thinking, Mary Beth? Um, dates to 1894 and was purchased with funds from the Graphic Arts Council, a really important group to my life here. Perfect, oh. perfect tee up. <laughs> so yes, I mean, our councils are really fantastic and um, they provide so much support for the curatorial um, departments. And Mary, talk a little bit about your council and what they do for yeah. you and, the, and, and your relationship there. Well, I've referred to the council as any curator's first museum family. Because when you move to a new town, you're meeting tons of people, tons of names. You're not really sure who is who. And I had to put this picture of Robert Trotman right in the center because Robert was the president of the Graphic Arts Council when I arrived. And he kindly took me to a lunch at South Park Grill and explained some things. And I even remember him saying, you're not going to remember all these names, but here's just kind of a general idea of what we're doing. And I was so grateful for his kindness and the way the group embraced me, um, telling me of their traditions and, and new directions. And so now we're really focused on three aspects. It's um, acquisitions, education, and exhibitions. And we try to do all of our activities revolve around supporting those three goals. Sure. And these works in particular? These works come from another direction. So uh, the Graphic Arts Council is crucial for me for building the collection. I've also been working with an individual who has a great love for the museum and for the graphic arts, who has, has worked very closely with me to identify holes in the collection, gaps in the collection, and will sometimes say, this museum needs more work by Albrecht Dürer, to which I say, you're so right. <laughs> so we agree, agree on a lot of these things. And the, the wonderful thing is then that this donor has made purchases specifically for our collection. So here you see some old masters and then also um, in the 19th century as well. Yeah, I think these acquisitions emerge, what, every several months we get something they do. quite yes, significant they for the do. collections committee. And for those of you who have been on the collections committee, and some of you have been, uh, you've seen these works um, in particular, and they're all leading up to something that we're planning for the future. So Mary, talk a little bit about your strategy about mm -hmm. the acquisition of these and what our vision is, and I'll add a little bit to that, that, that project. So I like to joke that I'm always happiest in 1890s Paris, and that's really kind of a sweet spot for me where I'm very, very comfortable. I know the art, the literature, the music, the politics, everything that's happening. And as I was thinking about what could I do here for a major show for Portland, um, I started thinking that there really hadn't been an exhibition for many, many years, decades, that focused on this small brotherhood of artists known as the Nabi. And they called themselves the Nabi, meaning prophet. They were, they were, they were young and a little pretentious. Uh, but they made outstanding work. And those are people like Pierre Bonnard, Edouard Vuillard, um, Paul Elie Ranson, and uh, Care Xavier Roussel. And so working with um, this individual who's been helping me, we've identified some key pieces in the market that are available and would be really strong additions to our collection. And we've made some really significant strides in that way. Yeah, it's very exciting because Mary is now in discussions with the Cleveland Museum of Art, one of the great museums in the world, about partnering with them on this project, the significance of the work, ha not having the scholarship uh, visited in some time, and I think you bring a fresh eye to it. So this could be something of great significance for this museum. These projects take years to, to, to really do the research, create the partnerships, develop the, um, uh, the, the relationships with the, the peer institution to bring them fruition, the catalog. So we're in the midst of it, and uh, you know we've, we've got it penciled in the schedule, although we haven't penned it in yet. We're just trying to be a little bit flexible to make sure we partner with Cleveland and maybe another partner. So that's very exciting for us. Um, also, this show is up now. It is, and I included this slide because I wanted to think about what we do here that's so important. And I think that is just constantly revisiting artists we think we already know, people like Whistler, um, putting up shows by artists that may be new to you. And it really is so good for our collection because it helps us see what do we have, 
Where are there gaps? Where do we build? And so I've been thrilled. Every time I walk through the galleries, there are people enjoying Whistler. They may be upstairs looking at brand new things made by Leica, and then come down and see Whistler, and then go over to the Chinese galleries. And it's something I value so much about being here in the museum is that we get these little views into different worlds just every time you round the corner into a new gallery. And just a remarkable artist is yeah. Whistler. Yes. Um, so this picture I wanted to put up, you know, one of the things that, you know, we talk about we've been able to invest in the curatorial department. One thing we haven't been able to do, for those of you who've been around this museum for some time, is get our print room back up and running at the level it was. That, that exchange where people would come into original works of art, see original works of art in the print studio, uh, in, the, in that space, and be able to uh, come close to co close uh, contact with original works of art. Um, part of it is due to the fact of, you know, some of the transitions we've had with due to the recession, um, some shifting models where uh, funding, some decrease in funding in some areas. So I think for me, I want to be very clear, the vision is to try to get that print room up and running. One pathway, and it's not easy to do that, is to endow Mary's position. So if you think of the curatorial department, we've been able to endow the conversation I had with Harold and Arlene Schnitzer when I arrived, and Harold came to me and he said, why isn't the Asian department up and running? I said, Harold, we don't have a curator. And at that time, Donald had retired and the budget didn't afford it. I said, why don't you endow the curator of Asian art? And Harold and Arlene did that. And it transformed us because we were able to recruit Mary Beth, who we'll talk to later, and has really set us on a course. Eventually, Janet and Richard Geary endowed Dawson's position. Uh, we have anonymous gift for the minor white curator of photography, and then the Eichholz uh, um, endowed the curator of modern contemporary art, and then we also have the Northwest art endowed, mm -hmm. thanks to Harold and Arlene. This is an opportunity, and I think part of this next campaign, as we move forward, is to endow this position. This position needs to be endowed, and I think in many ways, that would allow us then to get the print room up and running and free up some operational support to hire an assistant. Mm -hmm. I mean. Talk a little bit about what your vision would be, Mary, if we were able to achieve this. Well, uh, the print room is a wonderful living space, and you want to have it available for people to come do research. Uh, and sometimes the most fertile moments are when you have one person at one table studying you know, 18th century engravings and someone on the other table looking at something contemporary. And those little sparks that happen when people are, are in the room together. Um, one, this picture here is of me and my, um, my research assistant, China Bounds. And China was a summer fellow here at the museum, funded through the International Fine Print Dealers Association. So we're always looking for outside funding. We're um, always trying to get grants to help this, keep this mission alive. And the grant was really meant for hands-on training in the print room. And how do you handle prints? How do you identify papers? And so I think um, a print room is, is a place that, where you can offer something that you can't get from your screen or your tablet or your computer, and that's direct access to the objects. Yeah. So part of the strategic plan and our efforts moving forward, it's something that really we need to accomplish. Um, also, talk a little bit about the print fair, because it's really fun. It's a great moment for this museum to get works of art into the community. Well, when I uh, first came here, Bruce Gunther was the chief curator, and he came into my office one day. He says, Mary, you're doing a print fair. I said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but you, those of you who know Bruce know that he carries a certain amount of momentum. And so um, I, I grabbed onto his energy, and we created our first Portland in, uh, fine print fair in the winter of 2014. And since then, it has, we've kept it going. It's gotten um, more and more momentum. And it's an opportunity. We, Brian, I steal your line. You say that we bring the world to Portland and Portland to the world. And this is really a chance to bring the world to Portland, um, to bring specialized print dealers to our community so people can see not just hundreds, but thousands of works of original art in this one weekend. And it's really a way to get the community involved in understanding what we do, what we're looking at, and to foster this great print culture. Yeah, and I gotta give you a little tidbit of advice or insight on this. When you see a tag that says curator's choice on a print and you like it, buy it. <laughs> it's a great deal. Because the curators go through all of these prints and if they put their sticker on it, 
it's a good it's a good thing. It so. usually means what the curator would buy if she weren't paying for braces for her children. There we go. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So um, I have a number of questions, but I am committed to do 45 minutes of conversation up here, but then ask the audience if they have questions or comments or insights or advice for Mary and me or the museum. So I'm going to open it up, and if there are no questions, I have several here that I can ask because I think we'll conclude in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So I'll open up the floor to some questions. And Stephanie has a, you have a, um, you have a, a microphone. A microphone. Here. Can you hear me? It could be yeah. questions or comments. OK, I have a question then, Mary. Mm -hmm. Think of your questions. Um, you know, I think for me, running this museum, I'm always asking um, the team, are you satisfied with your career? What else do you need to achieve success, and what does success look like for you? Oh, that's a good question. He didn't tell me these questions ahead of time, just so you know. <laughs> um, you know, I feel, I have to say, I feel most successful. A, a successful day to me feels like when I'm able to connect with the art and then connect with people. And so I think I feel my greatest success doing a gallery talk when people ask great questions, or after a lecture when people share things about their own, their lives or their collecting history. So I feel, I feel that's really important, that, that part of, of bringing research to the public. And then honestly, when I think about success, I, I'm, not a, I'm not gonna be remembered 100 years from now, but my acquisitions will be here. And so there's something that makes me very, um, I take that responsibility really seriously. I don't want to bring in things frivolously. Um, I want to think about what will be important for future curators. I always joke that I'm doing, I'm trying to make a very good reputation for future curators. So that's, that's kind of what I think about in terms of a legacy. So what about, what, what motivates you to, to come to work every day? Like what, what drives you? You know, here it is, February, it's pouring rain, <laughs> the kids are sick, you're not feeling well, but it's, you, you come to the office and, and what, what's driving you? What's, what's pushing you forward? I, you know, I'm always curious. I just, I want to know more. I'm, I'm like someone who, I love, well, I was one of those annoying kids who sat in the front and loved school because I get to learn every single day. And being a generalist like this, where I go from Albrecht Durer to Carita Kent, um, I'm constantly learning and I feel like it offers me this little portal into another world. So the months or year I spent working on Carita Kent, I felt like I was in LA 1964. And working on Whistler, I felt like I was in London and Venice in the 1860s, 70s, 80s. Um, I don't know if there are other jobs that give you that opportunity, but it's, for me, it's such a treat. It's very, very gratifying. There was a question. OK, comment. Oh, that's a great question, whether art curators collect. I think almost all of us do. And, um, and it depends. I have seen some curators who have an astonishing collection. And I want to know um, where, where they're getting their, their acquisition money. Um, I think most of us collect on a pretty modest basis. So when I was in, uh, in France doing my dissertation research, I, could, I bought prints from the little booksellers. Can you picture them along the river? So I have works by Daumier and Gavarni. Uh, and then sometimes, especially, we should ask Sarah about this, uh, curators will be offered gifts by artists. And we have all sorts of conflict of interest rules we follow. Um, but you, you know, sometimes we'll have, have gifts that way. Now, one problem we have, though, is that we know what really good art looks like. So uh, my mother was trying to encourage me to collect. Um, we were looking at some drawings. And I said, I want drawings by Degas and Ang. And if I can't have those, I don't want any. And she told me that was a very bad attitude. <laughs> but you know, that's what I get at my day job. I get the best of the best. So um, the, the exciting thing for me, though, is, is seeing that there are really good prints at all price points. And you see that especially at the Portland Fine Print Fair, um, that there are prints selling for $60,000 and prints for a couple hundred dollars. And the quality is really good. Yes. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. So for me, my, my Gavarni prints and my Daumier prints remind me of my time in, in Paris. I have one of my favorite things in my own personal collection is, in, did you know Sissy Peltz in Milwaukee, yes, Peltz I Gallery? Yes, I there do. There was a wonderful um, elderly Jewish print dealer, Sissy, and um, we became quite good friends. And Sissy had this marvelous, interesting life. She had been a cartoonist for Cosmopolitan magazine back in the 40s. I mean, Sissy was, yeah, for maybe 30s, 40s. And when I moved from Milwaukee, she offered me one of her original drawings. And I have that framed, and it's hanging in my home. And Sissy has since passed away. But um, you know, in terms of monetary value, it's negligible. But it's so important to me because of the kindness Sissy had shown me, and and thinking about her, this you know um, young gal full of moxie drawing cartoons in Chicago, you know, back in the day. So I, you know, I just want to reflect on that. It's a really good point. One of the things that curators have to do is understand that works of art are an extension of people's lives. They're not just assets. They are not just. Um, images on a, on, a, on a piece of paper. They are an expression of their lives, people's, um, they're almost like children to people. And I think what's so important for our curators, and I know Mary has this sensitivity, is that when we're talking to potential donors or collectors, is really understanding the place where collections fit in people's lives. It's unlike anything else. Mm -hmm. Maybe their children and then their collections. Yes, another comment. Yeah, great, thank you, Barbara. Um, we have, I would say, less than 10% of the collection I oversee is drawings. We have a very, very small collection. We have a few knockouts, really gorgeous examples, but it's a, it's a very small collection of drawings. Um, and you're, I'm so glad you asked about collaboration. I was telling Brian earlier, one thing that I think makes this particular museum perhaps even unique is how well the cur curators get along. And um, I am a curator who overlaps with every single other curator's collection, except for Julia, although we're getting in with new digital media, we're starting to overlap. So um, I'm in constant dialogue with Mary Beth Graybill, our curator of Asian art, Dawson Carr, our curator of European art. Of course, we have lots of Northwest art, so I'm working with Grace on that. Many of my prints are contemporary. And that is really hard to do if you don't have a highly functioning curatorial department. Um, and so I'm very grateful for my colleagues. It's one of the best parts of working here. Yeah, and I think the mediums are getting broken down. I mean, yeah. we, you know, artists are using so many different types of mediums in different areas, and, and so the curators do need to, mm -hmm. to really collaborate. Did you have another question? Yes, you know, our drawings collection, we're never going to have an old master's drawings collection unless someone gives us a big chunk. But I really believe in strategically looking for opportunities. Um, there was a drawing I was interested in. I didn't even bring it to you, Brian. And I, I sort of hesitated. It was with a dealer. It was a, a Pierre Bonnard drawing. And I thought, oh, I don't know. Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I have the dealer send it to me? And I hesitated just long enough for the National Gallery of Art to buy it. Um, and it's gorgeous. I really should have had them send it to me. So I am looking at places, not, to, not as a drop in the bucket, but where it will have some context. So this particular drawing had really good context with some of our prints. Um, or if a drawing, Dawson Carr and I um, together sort of mounted a campaign to go to auction for a uh, drawing by Courbet that related, we thought, to our painting. Um, we ended up not bidding on it because uh, it, it turned out to be not quite right. But yes, we are looking, uh, but we'll never have that big, full, like old master drawing. Yeah, selection. and to that end, you know, we're looking at several old master drawing exhibitions, which I'm really interested in. I think that's an avenue for us where we can explore drawing at the highest level in a thoughtful way, and exhibitions are a great, great way for us to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. 
Oh. <laughs> I do, a wish list, that's a great, great question. Um, I do, I have a, a mental list and also have started working on a written document and I'm very shy to share it though. And that's one reason is because um, we, I can't control the market. As much as I try, there are certain objects I desperately want and I have never seen them for sale. Um, so there are certain things we just can't get. So let's say you'll know this work. I want um, Pierre Bonnard's Franz Champagne poster, right? Can't, yeah, I know you want that too. <laughs> but I can't find one on the market. But if I might say, okay, that one isn't coming up, but what other Bonnard posters might be available? And so I try to keep, I have specific objects, but I also try to keep sort of general things in mind. We could definitely use more Whistler in our collection. So I have certain ones that are at the top of my list, whether they will be available for purchase in a price that we can afford, we'll see. But um, yeah, I do, I do have um, a running sort of tally of areas where we could improve the collection. So one more question, any more? Okay, great. Um, thank you all for being here. And Mary, thank you for the conversation. And the next one will be December 5th with Julia. And uh, if you can make it, it would be great to have you here because I think it's really worthwhile. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you.